Next speaker um, probably needs very little introduction. Um, it's James' husband, um, who's um, a vet and a nutritionist and one of the founding members with uh, Richard Vackery of EBVC. So James, after qualifying from Cambridge as a vet, um, he worked in mixed practice in Glastonbury before um, taking on a scholarship at Bristol University. He went back into cattle practice until 2005 and um, then formed EBVC. James is an expert in his field as well as being an RCVS diploma holder. He's also a recognised specialist in cattle health and production with a special lectureship at the University of Nottingham. For the past five years, James has worked with the RCVS as an examiner for further specialist qualification and has continued to stay at the forefront of research and development. He's also vice chairman of the European Board of Bovine Experts. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome him here, and I hope you have an interesting and uh, talk on yielding to metabolic disease. Thank you very much, Mike. Can everybody hear me? Yeah? Good. I should apologise at the outset that I have neither a lump of cheese nor any slides uh, relating <coughs> to cheese. So I'm afraid it's going to be a cheeseless uh, 45 minutes. The other point is that I'm glad John hasn't gone yet because when it comes to the point of how to control negative energy balance and uh, loss of condition, which John has rightly highlighted as being very important, I'd like John to come back up and uh, give his views on how you could achieve that. Don't worry, John, I'm only joking. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd pass me the, give me the hospital pass. Okay, so I'm going to talk about metabolic disease. And first, I'm going to take you through a scenario. This is just one farm, uh, one farm that I'm involved with now. I must say I wasn't involved back in 2008 and 9. Uh, but what we see here is along the, along the top of the... Along the y-axis there, that's 305-day yield. So back in 2008, they were giving around about 7,500, 8,000 litres. If we go through 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, the yield goes up from 7,500, 8. It steadily increases and it ends up around about the sort of 9,500 litres. So quite a, a decent increase uh, in milk. What happened at the same time, and again, I'll show you the axes on this, it's the same time scale, so 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12. Uh, and on the uh, y-axis here, we've got uh, calving interval, which is in black, and we've got the conception rate, which is in red. And what we've seen is the conception rate has come down from a, a pretty healthy 40, 42, 3%, steadily down to 20%. Not surprisingly, at the same time then, if you've got your conception rate dropping like that, calving interval sort of uh, maintained for a while, pretty good. Well, okay, 400, I think you need to be under, uh, 410, sorry. I think you need to be under that really for very efficient uh, milk production. But uh, we saw a very large increase in calving interval. Plus, at the same time, we saw an LDA rate increase from nothing to 4%. Now, I'm not saying this should happen on uh, every farm. I'm saying it does happen. Uh, and I want to go over uh, in the next half an hour or so of what we need to do to try and prevent that happening, i.e., how can we have high yields, uh, but at the same time as having these high yields, we can also enjoy pretty good uh, rates of metabolic disease and not fall into the trap of, of poorer reproductive performance. And, what must we concentrate on to achieve those high yields uh, and to get the good health and fertility? Okay, first I'm going to show you this graph. And this graph uh, relates to why it is so important to maintain uh, a very good reproductive performance in a herd uh, when you have increased yields. That there is the shape of the <coughs> lactation curve. So here's days in milk. So that's going from calving right through till... Uh, a standard 305 day lactation. The blue is a typical lactation curve for a older cow, so it's a three plus lactation cow. The red is a second lactation. The green is a heifer. Now, if you look at the mathematics of lactation curves, they should follow this uh, pattern very closely. So we start off peak, peak in this case here is 40 litres. What we should see is by 305 days, they've got to roughly 50, 55% of the peak yield. So at 
uh, three or five days, they should be doing more than 20 litres uh, in this case. It's different for heifers. Heifers, as you all know, they don't peak as high, but they keep going. And there's a crossover sometime later on in lactation where the heifers actually persist better than the cows do. So what does this mean in terms of fertility uh, and the effect it's going to have on production? Well, if you look at that and say, right, we're at uh, 40 litres, we're down to 20 litres at 240 days later, so uh, the time past peak to 305 days, they're losing around about 0.08 to 0.1 litres a day. So if you have a drift in your calving interval, and what you get with a drift in your calving interval is that the days in milk uh, will go up, then you can see that when you're increasing the average days in milk in the herd, you're going to be losing uh, litres. So it's absolutely crucial that when we do have increases in yield to keep maximum efficiency, we also need to make sure that fertility is maintained as well. OK, so what is the optimum calving interval? Well, I would say on the herds that are really, really efficient, they keep the average days in milk, and this is talking, of course, all year round calving, they keep the average days in milk down to 180 days or less. And there's probably a lot of you in the room that will disagree with this. Uh, we did some work on uh, quite a large number of herds. We were looking at the effect across uh, different yields to see what the optimum calving interval uh, was. And actually, we found, you probably disagree with that in some cases, from a purely mathematical point of view, and that comes from that last uh, curve, so we have more cows that are closer to peak yield. In all cases, it was better to have a shorter calving interval. So even in the herds that were giving 11,000 litres, <coughs> it was beneficial to keep shaving off days off the calving interval. So there is a big benefit in being able to keep fertility going. OK. We can argue about that later if you like. People always do, but in our analysis, that's what we found. I should say, actually, that the effect was slightly less uh, pronounced in heifers because of the shape of the lactation curve being flatter. It didn't matter quite so much if you move slightly further away from the peak yield. So, you know, having the heifers delayed slightly more than the cows with a l slightly longer <coughs> calving interval didn't uh, affect the heifers' profitability as much as the cows. Okay, so the other thing... I want to just mention is when we're looking at uh, a proxy for uh, reproductive performance, we often look at the calving interval. It's, it's an okay first stop. Uh, it gives us a slightly historical figure of what's been going on in the last nine months. But nevertheless, it's a figure that most people have on farm. The thing to be careful of, though, is when we're looking at uh, these, we're looking at averages. And averages don't tell us the full picture. Uh, because you'll get most of the cows that will have a calving interval here. This is a uh, number of cows uh, that have calving intervals of particular length. So, you know, the 385, 395 uh, column is here, and there's about 27 cows in each that have uh, that calving interval in this particular herd. Uh, to make up that average, we have the ones that are in the middle, but we also have these ones out here. And these cows metabolically, which we get, will be going on to, you probably all realise are the cows that are most likely to give us the problems. So if we do get a slide in reproductive performance, we're much more likely to have cows with very extended calving intervals. And what are those cows going to do for us? Potentially, those cows are the ones that get fat. They sit in the uh, dry cow group for an awful long time. Uh, and they're the ones that give us much more hassle after calving unless we're really careful. And we'll talk a little bit later about what we can do to try and decrease, decrease the risk uh, of those uh, causing you trouble after calving. Uh, this is something I like to look at for all my clients, which is uh, what we do is you can split out. This is just from Interherd. You can use it in lots of other, you can do it in lots of other programs as well. You look, you split the cows out uh, by month of calving, and you look at that particular month what the uh, cows, it, sorry, go back again. <coughs> that would be cows that calved, for instance, here in April 2012. That is the recording that was in uh, April 2012. Whoops, it tells you, here we go. Here we go. It tells you what the average cow that calved in April 2012 was doing at the April 2012 recording. 
So by looking at that, you can see what the cows that are most recently calved have been doing. So in this case, uh, it's those ones there. How many litres are the ones that have been calved uh, a month doing? How many litres are the cows that have been calved two months are doing? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the important thing, again, much the same as the calving interval, we're not just looking at the average figure, but it's very useful to see how that average is made up. So, for instance, in a, in a bigger herd, you can see the trends more clearly. But if you had a load of cows that had calved in the last months and you looked to see what those cows were doing in terms of uh, uh, lactation, and you saw that you had, uh, here we've got three cows that are doing 48, 46, 49. We've got one cow doing 27 at 10 days post-calving. So, you know, what we're looking at is whether cows are calving in and they're hitting the targets that we expect after the first 10 days or so in milk. And if we get, the difference between the really, really good herds and the herds that aren't quite so good is that the really good herds, they will have more of the cows hitting their targets. The herds that are not so good, you will have uh, more cows that are being tripped up by something. So the average figure for milk will be lower and there will be more cows that are not quite hitting the targets, not quite uh, launching into lactation very well. It doesn't have to be 100 pounds by 10 days. That is an American figure from a, an institute that I had the figures from. You set the levels for yourself, but you monitor it very carefully each month to see whether your cows are calving in and to see whether they're calving in and they're hitting the targets that you're uh, expecting them to hit. You can very easily then pick up the cows that are sick. You can't expect the sick cows to really show up extremely easily like this. You'll often pick up these cows uh, that have may maybe have a displaced abomasum in early lactation. You can often pick them up um, at the recordings if you look closely enough. That becomes much more important perhaps on very large herds because if you have very large herds with labour that perhaps uh, isn't quite as expert, you need to be looking at the milk recordings very closely. So not just the monthly milk recordings but the daily milk recordings to see if there are cows that aren't giving uh, the milk that you expect them to give. So we need to use milk recordings uh, much more effectively to be able to pick up the cows where something is going wrong. Because like John says, you know, he gives the example of mastitis and lameness. It's the same with metabolic disease too. Um, if you have a cow that has an LDA, um, it's often associated with another disease. She'll often then drop in milk production very quickly and you can pick them up quite easily and just check them to make sure they're okay. So it's really monitoring and vigilance, very important in early lactation to pick up those cows. Okay, so if we go on to what the effects of, are, what the effects of these diseases are on, on fertility, this was a, a study that was done a couple of years back and it was looking at the percentage of cows uh, that had health problems in the first 60 days in milk and uh, whether they got pregnant or not. And what you see here is if they had one case of disease in that first 60 days in milk, the pregnancy rate went down from a very healthy 51.4% down to 43. If they had greater than one case of disease, it fell further again. And if you wanted to break it down into uh, what those type of problems were, uh, you can see that there's uh, plenty of diseases here that we'd hope, you know, lameness is a topic of uh, earlier, 33%. So if you had uh, a health problem that was lameness, you would lose about a third uh, of the pregnancy rate there. Okay, the same is true for looking at how uh, the animals hang on to the pregnancies. So this is uh, health problems and pregnancy loss in the first 60 days. So these have been pregnant, um, but they had a case of disease in that first 60 days. And as you can see again, if we get more diseases, we do tend to lose pregnancies. So we need to prevent this disease. And a lot of the metabolic diseases that we come on to, we're talking really about uh, the negative energy balance leading on to DAs, <coughs> ketosis, fatty liver, they will be very tightly um, uh, connected. So if you have one case of metabolic disease, all these diseases become uh, much more likely. So we need to be able to control it because it does have huge positive effects on uh, fertility if we can. <coughs> right, and running through some physiology, I think we need to know a little bit of uh, physiology to give you some background. Um, here's calving, day zero. 
here's what the cow does in dry matter intake. So we know at calving that suddenly there is a huge uh, energy demand for uh, milk production. Pre-calving, the energy demands are actually really quite slight. So the, uh, the energetic costs of carrying a fetus are, are really quite small. Uh, the cow covers its dry period uh, energy requirements extremely easily. But this is a bit of a design fault we have with cows here, Joe, just at the point when we really want them to rank up the amount they eat because the amount of energy that they uh, require has gone up enormously. They do exactly the wrong thing, and the dry matter intake drops off very dramatically, especially in that last three, four days uh, prior to calving. Now, addressing why these cows do that and trying to have preventative uh, uh, protocols in place to try and stop that are really crucial because just at the moment when we have uh, the energy uh, requirement increasing, the cow has to draw on its fat stores. And we know from what John was saying, and I'll show you some more evidence in a minute, uh, that if those cows start to mobilize fat extremely rapidly at that time, they are really going to have problems further downstream. So the return to positive energy balance, it takes about six weeks, and this was 20 studies uh, that were done in the States, around right about six weeks to get back into positive energy balance. But what we want to do, we can sort of accept that they're going to go into negative energy balance. That is going to happen. But what we're aiming to do is to try and decrease the magnitude uh, of that negative energy balance in that first few weeks uh, post-carving. Now, actually, I won't talk about this. I'll show you a graph in a second. What is the relationship between energy balance and yield? Right, hands up for all those that think, and this is across, this is, again, meta-analysis. Um, what is the relationship between energy balance and yield? Hands up for all those people that think there is a relationship between cows that give a huge amount of milk and the amount of negative energy balance they experience. <coughs> so high-yielding cows, do they experience necessarily much greater levels of negative energy balance. Hands up if you think that's true. Yeah, empirically you'd think that was true, wouldn't you? You'd think there's a very strong relationship. If you look at the, the second graph down there, that is the NEL, that's the energy secreted in the milk. So that is the yield. That there is the energy balance. So what we'd expect if you're correct is as yield increases, so as that, big, that number gets bigger along this axis here, then negative energy balance is going to get um, worse. So we're going to have them going down that way, which it does. It does get slightly worse, but the correlation is incredibly small. That's a sneeze, isn't it? I mean, I'd be embarrassed actually to put a line through that because, you know, that does not look like a strong correlation to me. So there's a very poor correlation between negative energy balance and yield. What that means is, that's good news really, believe me that's good news, because what that means is if you can get them to eat more, then you can improve the energy balance. So that's why we see the first farm I showed you, maybe there was a relationship there between we, they weren't uh, getting those cows to eat enough and there was negative energy balance and the fertility was suffering, but there's an awful lot of farms where the yield goes up, they probably do a lot more managementally to make sure those cows eat more, and there's no reason why uh, if you are requiring, um, sorry, if they eat more, that you should not uh, be able to uh, not fall into the trap of huge amounts of negative energy balance. So what that's saying is energy balance is related to feed intake, not absolute yield. I've totally except that as yields go up, it is more challenging to be able to meet the demands, but it's not impossible, as these graphs will show. Okay, so I haven't got too many of these more difficult graphs, but I need to show you this one. What was John was talking about earlier, he was talking about the fat in the fat pad. Of course, there's fat uh, stored uh, in other depots around the body, much more uh, useful ones for actually fulfilling the energy requirements in early lactation. <laughs> and what you've got here, in early lactation, you've got high levels of growth hormone. So the cow, especially the very high-yielding <coughs> cows, high levels of growth hormone, and you've got this stored fat, this here, this tag, uh, being mobilized, and you get NIFAs, non-esterified fatty acids. 
Those needlers go shooting off into the bloodstream. Uh, some of them go off into the udder, so they get taken up in the udder. That's why uh, cows that mobilise huge amounts of fat in early lactation, you, get, you tend to have higher butter fats at the first recordings. But the vast majority of it goes off uh, into the liver. Now, we needn't worry too much about the uh, biochemistry that's going on in there, but if there's a second design fault in a cow around the time of calving that's going to uh, jeopardise it metabolically, the first one being the intakes drop just at the time we want intakes to uh, increase around the time of calving. The other design fault is the liver that has to, that has to deal with all that mobilised fat is not very good at exporting that fat back out again in very, very early lactation. What that means is we would like to, for that fat to either be burnt off, it's a useful uh, energy source, this, these NIFAs, they can use it metabolically, they can use it for energy, um, but if they can't use it, what we don't want to happen is that it goes off into the liver itself and it sits there. What we want to happen is it either gets burnt or it gets secreted back out again with these things called VLDLs, very low density lipoproteins. Uh, the cow is really bad in early lactation at getting that fat back out of the liver again. So logically what we'd really like to do is if we can decrease the amount of fat that is being mobilized, then not only are we having those positive effects potentially on the cow's feet, but also we're decreasing this huge tidal wave of mobilized fat, these NIFAs, that are going to go off to the liver at a time when the liver is not very good at exporting it back out again. So what we have here is, is a bit of a perfect storm that we have loads of mobilized fat because we've got huge uh, energy demands. Uh, the liver is not great at being able to process it, so we end up with fatty liver. So fatty liver is, we've got too much uh, mobilized fat, it gets stuck in the liver. It stays in there for a few weeks, but that's long enough for us to have derailed those cows in early lactation. Okay, right, this is the last complicated slide. Um, you'll all be familiar with insulin. Insulin is the hormone of plenty, so when a cow is in very positive en energy balance, or when we are, we have very high levels of insulin. What insulin should do is it should shut off that, mobilized, uh, that, that fat mobilization. So say if the cow does start to go back into uh, a bit more positive energy balance, you should have insulin then that shuts off that mobilization and that is fat going to NIFAs. So that should shut the fat mobilization off. What we can get with cows that have um, excessive amounts of, oh, I'm destroying that, excessive amounts of uh, fat mobilization is very high levels of NIFAs are effectively quite toxic to the cow. And what it does through something called tumor necrosis factor, which is an inflammatory mediator, so you can see this, um, this huge amount of fat mobilization as almost like an inflammatory condition, it actually blocks that effect of insulin. So you get effectively these cows in early lactation that are uh, like diabetics. They are insulin resistant. Um, and what that actually means is we can't shut off that fat mobilization. So if we have these cows that something has happened to them pre-calving, and we'll talk about that in a second, so we've treated them wrongly pre-calving, we get to the situation where we get huge amounts of fat mobilization and we can't shut it off. They become insulin resistant and we have uh, that problem where we have all this uh, mobilized fat that is ending up in the liver. Okay, so that, that's the crux of the problem really. We need to find a way to be able to decrease the amount of fat that's mobilized because we know those fats, when they are mobilized, will have negative effects uh, on uh, insulin. Uh, and shutting off that fat mobilization. So I hope this, so far I'll drum it into you that excess fat mobilization really, really is bad news from lots and lots of angles. Uh, I'll whiz through these, but there's lots and lots of studies showing that um, if we've got very high levels of fat pre-carving, it's very strongly related to whether we get uh, displaced abomasums or not. Pregnancy risk post-carving as well. So we have a much reduced chance of pregnancy in cows that have higher levels of NIFAs uh, pre-carving. Uh, that study there is the most recent big study on it. Uh, NIFA levels that were over 0.57 uh, 
pre-carving, much in increased risk of DAs, ketosis, metritis. So bad news. Another thing there on fertility, if we've got very high levels of fat mobilization, it can also have a toxic effect on the oocyte. So it can have a toxic effect on the eggs that we are trying to get those cows pregnant to uh, maybe in 50, 60 days time. So I don't need to hammer on too much about that, but I hopefully have given you enough information that very high leafers, very high levels of fat mobilization is very bad news for fertility, health, and also uh, production. Uh, so, uh, here, very high levels of NIFAs caused a 4% to 7% uh, reduction in yield. So, this is the point where I should get John back up now. We know excessive negative energy balance is really bad, but what are we going to do about it? Uh, and that is a very difficult question. Um, one of the things that we know is very strongly related to whether cows are going to mobilise fat is how fat they are uh, pre-carving. And... I think the, the figures that John gave you were, was it two and a half to three? Yeah, two and a half to three at drying off, two and a half to three at <laughs> calving would be uh, the right level. We look at these cows here, we've got a, an average of two and a half to three, job done. Trouble is, neither of those cows there is two and a half to three. So again, we're not looking at averages, we're looking at how many cows actually fall in that range. Okay, so when you go in and average out a cow, it's on, you know, when you go into a group of dry cows and you see some that are one, some that are five, some that are two, some that are four, that's not good. We want every cow to be two and a half to three. It's that consistency, if we can do it, that is extremely important. So I don't think anybody's going to argue with two and a half to three. Uh, what about white bag solutions? So when you say white bag solutions, things that come in a bag that are extremely <coughs> expensive, if you remember back to that slide about what happens in the liver, what we can do potentially is we can increase the cow's ability to uh, make these very, do very low density lipoproteins. Remember we said the, the cow is really bad in the first couple of weeks post-calving at getting that fat back out of the liver. If we can increase the chances of uh, getting higher levels of those export proteins to get the fat out of the liver, we're probably going to help that cow clear the fat out a bit more quickly. And there is a certain amount of evidence that, well, actually there's quite good evidence that uh, if you feed uh, products such as choline, then uh, it helps the production of VLDLs and you will get um, a better clearance of fat uh, out of the liver. The other thing that's often put forward is methionine, rumen protective methionine. It's an amino acid that cows potentially are a bit short of. So there's quite a bit of interesting research work going on at the moment that if you feed cows uh, rumen protected methionine pre-carving and potentially choline as well, you may increase the chances of getting that uh, fat out of the liver. But we don't always want to reach for the white bag. The white bag is probably a bit of a last resort, really. They're very expensive. There must be other ways that we can do it first. <coughs> they may have a place, but it isn't the first port of call. So what can we do to influence that one design fault, that drop in dry matter intake around the time of calving. So again, we've seen this, when it gets close to calving, just when we want it to, the energy, sorry, the dry matter intake to go up, it goes down. What can we do? Right, body condition score then. This is the science that is sort of behind uh, a lot of the work on uh, what the target levels of negative energy, of, of, sorry, of body condition score should be. Here we've got calving, here we've got uh, four months into lactation. Here we've got fat cows, here we've got the cows that we think are probably about right, so two and a half to condition score three, and here we've got skinny cows. What you find is fat cows are more or less programmed to lose more condition because they get to the same uh, set body condition score point about three or four months into lactation. So if we have fat cows, we're much more likely uh, to get them to lose condition in early lactation. So that's the first thing. I tend to get obsessed with fat cows, but actually I go and talk in Northern Ireland sometimes and they say, well, all our cows are skinny, they're not fat at all. Um, but it's actually, it's just as important that we need to get them in the range. We don't want cows to be uh, too skinny because as John said, we can have those effects on uh, lameness. We want the cows to be uh, the Goldilocks cows, the two and a half to threes, not too fat, not too thin. And I like to look at uh, dry cows as apples or pears. We're after pears. 
We're after cows with really, really good rumen fill, so a lot of low down weight. Uh, we're not after cows with a lot of condition high up. So we want muck cows to look more like pears and less like apples. Here we've got very poor rumen <coughs> fill and we've got a lot of fat along the back. I think I've trained some of the farmers to actually to say, right, have we got apples or pears at the moment going through? And they'll say, no, I think we've got more pears coming through, and that's good news. If we have more apples coming in, then we have to do something about it and try not to create as many in the first place uh, and maybe use things like Kextone or whatever to try and um, clear the problem. So condition score, definitely. We need to get condition score two and a half to three. What about overfeeding? Uh, well, there's a lot of trials showing that this is the dry period here. That's the whole of the dry period. If we overfeed the cows um, prior to calving, so this is the entire dry period spent overfed uh, compared with the entire dry period spent on paper underfed, what does that do for the metabolic health of those cows? And it may surprise you, but the ones that are overfed, you tend to have very high intakes here. That's 2% of body weight. So they're eating a lot. They're eating probably 14, 15 kilos dry matter. <laughs> what you see with those cows is they do exactly the wrong thing. They drop off much more markedly at the end. Whereas the ones that are underfed, so that's 1% of body weight, they're only getting about 6, 7 kilos dry matter um, in this particular study. They don't drop off at all. They just keep eating. That scenario there is thought to be worse much worse, actually, than that scenario there for metabolic disease. So if we overfeed cows for long periods prior to calving, so if we have the entire dry period where the cows are overfed, the cows will lose uh, more condition uh, because intakes drop very close to calving. That causes an explosion of NIFAs to go into uh, the bloodstream. There's the effect. Look at that. So this is the amount of fat that is in the liver. We don't want fat in the liver. The cows that are overfed, that's before calving, they're sort of all right. When it gets to the point here where you saw that the dry matter intakes were dropping in those overfed cows, they start uh, mobilizing fat. The liver has to cope with it. And we get very high levels. 10% fat in the liver is bad news. For the cows that are underfed, there's no real fat mobilization going on. Yeah. What do you mean by restricted intake? Well, in this particular trial, they had a high energy density ration. I'll go on to the practicalities a bit later, but yeah, they, they had a, they had a, a very high energy density uh, ration, but they were restricting the amount of dry matter they could get. So effectively, it was something like an 11 and a half, me it was an American study, but about 11 and a half megajoule per kilo, and they were restricting them to about six or seven kilos. So we were talking about 70, 70 megajoules, something like that, all the way through. Um, We'll talk about the practicalities in a minute. So, yeah, this is, uh, this is in Spain. I was uh, on this farm, and those are the far off dry cows. And, okay, you, these far, they had very level, low levels of metabolic disease on these farms. The far off dry cows, when they saw grub, they ran after the tractor to get it, they were hungry. Um, that was only in the far off cows. In the transition dry cows, they were putting on a ration that was more conventional. Um, just to get something that's closer to Cumbrian weather. Uh, that was in uh, Latvia a couple of weeks ago. Uh, same effect. This was cows outside. They had access to, they could go inside. I mean, they, they weren't kept out there. They had the choice to go outside and to just eat some round bale hay. And actually, a lot of the trial work suggests that it is almost impossible to underfeed a far off dry cow. Their energy requirements are really, really low and it's very easy to overfeed a far off dry cow. I think if you're gonna do that strategy, you need to say, okay, far off dry period, they can have something very low energy density, but for the last three weeks or so prior to calving, then they have to go onto a transition ration. I wouldn't be feeding that right up to calving. But the point that I want you to take from here is, if that was maize fed all the way through the dry period on one ration, they would get, they may not necessarily get that fat actually, but they would increase their chances of mobilizing fat when the real hit came for energy around the time of calving. So overfeeding is one of the most dangerous things to do in the dry period if you want to uh, prevent them mobilizing excessive fat. This was a herd in, in a, well, I should have drawn out actually on the camera. This cow here had been dry for four months. 
It was a single ration. All the way through the dry period, it was maize that was diluted down with straw. Energy density on paper was all right. Well, I mean, what, it was around about sort of eight and a half megajoules, nine megajoules, something like that, uh, for far off dry period. But look at the length of the straw. This cow was an expert at just standing there. And it was dry, uh, long chopped straw. She could get at the maize. She didn't have to eat any straw if she didn't want to. So m the problem, I think, with single group rations is if you're going to feed them all the way through the dry period, they can be great. They can um, decrease the amount of chaos sometimes you get on farms of cows going off here uh, to one farm being fed, then coming back too close to calving and potentially not having a good enough transition. But if you're going to do it, they really can't sort it. It's got to be something that every bite they take has got to be the same. They cannot sort it or they will go for the good stuff. And if they go for the good stuff, they will almost by default go for the maize, the whatever sources of starches they can get, and they will tend to get fat. And that will predispose them uh, to uh, excessive fat mobilization. So I'm not against single group rations, but you've just got to be very careful. You've got to smash them to pieces. If, and the straw has got to be unsortable. Individual uh, interventions, well, if you have got cows that uh, you're having a problem with, of course, everybody will have heard of Kekstone now. It's been, we've had saturation uh, with Kekstone for the last uh, couple of years, and there is good evidence that it reduces the metabolic disease, um, and the mechanism by which it does that is it just increases the amount of propionate uh, that the cows produce in the rumen, and propionate is what we need for glucose production. What I find, though, is you know, you, you'll often get people who will say, I'd like to just do the ones that I think are higher risk, but how do you pick the ones that are higher risk? I think it is actually quite tricky. We know the fat ones are probably ones that uh, we should be targeting, and people do tend to uh, uh, target the fat ones, but you do get the situation now, and, I'm, and from an industry point of view, I'm not sure if it's the best thing that people just give it to everything. And I've got herds that actually have done that, so we'll just give it to everything. I'm sure it pays for itself um, because you get the increase in yield, but I'm not sure if it's great for uh, the image to the consumer if we do everything with it. Um, I think we, try, we need to try and be a bit uh, more targeted. Which cows do we target? The fat ones, definitely. If your vet is doing uh, scanning for twins, then yeah, twins as well. Uh, my, my wife's a cartoonist. This cartoon is my favourite. The older cows, the ones that perhaps are slightly disadvantaged, um, they perhaps are the ones we want to target. But you know, sometimes we use it in the face of an issue. Um, pick the cows that you think are highest risk, which will tend to be the fat ones, the one with twins, the ones with previous issues, the ones that look a bit skinny. Um, but m my view is I, I wouldn't at the moment give it to everything. Um, I think we need to be more selective. What about other, other interventions? So we can use the Kekstone. We know it works. Uh, we know it has a, a, a place. Um, the other thing that we can do is if we increase the supply of propionate uh, to the rumen, so if we give something that the, the rumen can uh, get as propionate and turn it into oxaloacetate, then we get more glucose production. Which products do that? Uh, propylene glycol, glycerol. And this is a study here showing that... Um, uh, if you can monitor the cows, this is very uh, intensive monitoring, but if the cows were monitored from day 3 to 16 days in milk for subclinical ketosis, they're using uh, either sticks or meters, and then intervening on the cows that had uh, high levels of ketones. And remember, the ketones are produced from that fat that's mobilized. So the nephers, uh, a lot of them will end up as ketones. If we go and uh, intervene and uh, drench them, with propylene glycol, then there were decent effects. The propylene glycol treated animals, so these are the ones that had subclinical ketosis. It wasn't every animal, it was the ones that had subclinical ketosis. They were more likely to be cured of the subclinical ketosis. They were half as likely to become clinical uh, ketosis. They were 40% less likely to develop a displaced abomasum, half as likely to be culled or sold in the first 30 days. So this is a very similar effect to what you're going to get with Kekstone. It's, it's increasing the supply of propionate in the rumen. And you can see you know, it does work. So if we have the cows that 
uh, we are worried about if they haven't got enough um, uh, propylene glycol, uh, sorry, if they haven't got enough propionate produced, they're going to uh, reduce the amount of glucose uh, for milk production. Okay, I'll skate over this, but I put it in there because I don't, I don't want people to forget that there are, of course, other management issues such as feed space, moving around uh, between pens, decreasing the amount of stress, and basically these come down to increasing the amount of dry matter intake around the time of calving. So stressful events, moving, it's all going to decrease the amount of dry matter intake, uh, and we know that that's going to make them more likely to mobilise fat. This was a, a German herd um, it's making the same point, really. There was all sorts of technology in place to mix the food and bring it to the cows, but actually, uh, when you got to the bunk area, there was nothing there. <laughs> so uh, this cow here, it was when the food did come, it was almost like one of these burger-eating contests. They were in there, and they were, they were you know, completely gorging themselves, but that's not what we want. It may be nice and clean down the troughs, but they have to have food in front of them all the time. And there's the effect. This is a nice one because it quantifies how much space you need. And we often say, you know, they need to have 60 centimetres, the width of a cow, especially if they are complete TMR-fed herds where there's nothing in the parlour. They need the space because cows like to eat together. And the red line, so the line down here, is if they have 8 inches of space, that's 20 centimetres. That is, what's that, a third of the width of a cow? They're not going to get to eat together. And you can see that because that's about a third as high as that one, as the peak when... Uh, when there is uh, 80 centimetres of space. You get a slightly diminishing return. You see uh, 20 centimetres, 40 centimetres, yeah, it's doubling. When you get to 60 centimetres, the difference between 60 and 80 was not that marked. But it shows that you can't really go less than 60. You have to have that. Pushing up helps. Pushing up uh, there. Every time you have a push up, you get a spike of dry matter intake. So dry matter intake, we know, is crucial to get that negative energy balance down as low as we can. Housing, well, I think it depends on the farm. Sometimes you go to a farm and the facilities are fantastic and everything's extremely comfortable and the heifers manage perfectly well. You go to other farms where perhaps there isn't quite so much space and then there probably is quite a big advantage in moving the heifers uh, into their own feeding group. Um, this study here, if the heifers were put into their own group rather than uh, mingling in that first month after calving, uh, 230 kilos more milk uh, to 305 days and less ketosis treatment. I think that depends on the farm, of where you decide you want to do your grouping, which cows go where. But on lots of herds, I think it's extremely important. And again, going back to John's work, if we've got heifers that have come in, they're the future for the herd, we make them lose a lot of condition uh, in the first 30 days. Potentially, we've jeopardized them for the rest of their lives, for their feet alone. So can be extremely useful. Right, I'm going to finish off on milk fever. I put it last because it's my pet topic, and I'll go on forever if I don't. But I'd say milk fever is incredibly important because it has big effects on immune function. So yeah, if we can control milk fever well, we have less whites, uh, we have less mastitis, we also have a greater chance of increasing uh, the energy status of the cows because they'll tend to eat more. Um, and an increased risk of premature culling in those cows that do get um, low blood calcium levels. It can be a lot of extra work if you have big problems with it. And I think now you'd say it is very controllable. Whether we do it by uh, what we're feeding them pre-calving or we do a combination of what we're doing pre-calving and strategic drenching post-calving, depending on... Uh, the facilities you've got, the amount of mixes you can do, um, but it is definitely very largely controllable. This is a study, part of the results of a study that we're doing at the moment, and that's looking at the level of blood calcium uh, in the first 24 hours after calving. And we usually set the level at 2 millimoles per litre. So we say if it goes under 2 millimoles per litre, those cows are um, subclinically hypocalcemic. If we set that at one point, uh, at two uh, millimoles per litre, the majority of the cows actually are subclinically hypocalcemic. So it's incredibly uh, common. The results that you see from the states are about 50%. The results that we see uh, in 
the work that we do in the UK, it's exactly the same. It's extremely common. Now, you almost think whether, what is that noise? <laughs> we almost wonder whether two millimoles per litre is an achievable target. And in fact, now I would say, I'd probably say, if you can get them over 1.8 millimoles per litre in that first uh, 24 hours after carving, you're doing pretty well. Um, it's a very easy thing to monitor. Um, you can take blood samples. If you're worried that you know, you're having a lot of whites, for instance, you can just say, OK, we'll take ten, the next 10 cows, first 24 hours after carving, we'll get a blood sample, we'll stick it in the fridge. When we've got 10, we'll run it, and we'll see what the level is. Uh, do that before you give any intervention, of course. Um, but it gives you a, a level to see what the level of subclinical milk fever in the herd is. What causes it? Well, excess metabolic alkalosis. That sounds very complicated, but cows normally... I'll show of hands, actually. Are cows normally acidotic or alkalotic? Hands up for acidotic. Hands up for alkalotic. Oh, there's a lot of abstainers. OK. Uh, cows are normally alkalotic. Uh, if you measure the pH of a cow's pee, it's going to be more than 8, neutral 7. So cows are normally alkalotic, and it's no problem for them, uh, except for when they come up to that immediate uh, time prior to calving. Then you need cows to be much less alkalotic, even slightly metabolically acidotic, <coughs> because that helps them then get the calcium out of the bone and from the gut more effectively. So in practical terms, what that means is we need to restrict dietary potassium um, in the lead up to calving because the more potassium they have, the more alkalotic they get. So we don't want to get too hung up on the technicalities, but it really comes down to we take as much potassium out the ration as we possibly can in that final lead up uh, to carving. Lack of magnesium, that message I'll show you, that's got through really well to UK farmers that we need to feed uh, more magnesium pre-carving uh, uh, to prevent milk fever. I'll show you the results in a second. Um, so these are decamp values. So the more positive that value, it means the greater that uh, feedstuff is going to push the cow towards alkalosis. So here, for instance, we've got quite a strongly positive value. And that means if you feed a load of grass silage uh, prior to calving, the cows will be fairly alkaline. They probably have a urine pH of about 8.5. And as I say, in lactation, that's no problem at all. Lead up to calving, it can be significant because we don't want them to be too alkalotic. If we want to pick feedstuffs that are uh, less uh, alkalogenic, we would pick straw, whole crop silage, maize silage. A lot of the things like brewer's grains is wonderful. Brewer's grains is a negative value. So brewer's grains is slightly acidifying, which it works really well pre-carving. It's a good source of protein, and it also uh, will make the cows slightly metabolically acidotic. So that's good. Uh, what about things like molasses? Should we feed molasses pre-carving? On paper, no, but that is per kilo of dry matter. When you feed molasses, you don't feed much of it. So it doesn't have a very strong alkalinizing effect because you're not feeding that much. But if you go to the, the forages, you're feeding a, a heck of a lot of the forage. So a strongly positive value for a forage is going to have a bigger loading effect than something where you're hardly feeding any of it. So what we've got here is grass silage can be absolutely fine. Uh, it could be down at a, a positive 200, but it could be a positive 1,000. And if you had a positive 1,000 and you fed any of that to a dry cow, it's very, very strongly alkalinizing, and you're likely to get milk fever, and you need to uh, reduce that particular grass silage down and replace it by either another cut. Uh, first cut tends to be very, very high. Second cut tends to be lower. Um, or you put in a bit more straw or whole crop. How many people process straw for their dry cows? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's getting much more common, and it's really for a couple of reasons that if you're processing quite a lot of straw, you can get them to eat it pre-carving, and it will dilute the amount of potassium that you feed uh, to those cows. So it does make them much less likely to have milk fever. It also decreases the energy density a little bit, which if you're feeding it for the whole of the dry period, remember, 
it's difficult to underfeed a dry cow. You can put quite a lot of straw in. As long as they'll eat it, it's a good thing. Um, it actually has a lot of value. Magnesium, this, these same cows that we took the calcium from. So remember the calcium, almost all of them, well, no, that's not true, 50%-ish were uh, under uh, our target value. Magnesium, I think farmers have got the message that we have to feed a bit more magnesium and it will tend to be in the dry cow minerals, it will tend to be in dry cow rolls, people are out of it, mag chloride, all of those things uh, will increase the magnesium concentration. Magnesium we don't see as a massive problem uh, in the samples that we've had sent in. It, calcium, yes, definitely, but magnesium, most people are feeding enough. What's the downside with feeding too much magnesium? The problem with feeding too much magnesium, in common with feeding too much in the way of anionic salts, which deliberately try and acidify the cows, is they're incredibly unpalatable. So remember, we're trying to get those cows to eat as much as we can in that immediate period just prior to calving. If we pack that with mag chloride and we also uh, pack it with other anionic salts, we are probably going to increase the drop-off in dry matter intake that we get prior to calving. So you've got to be careful and you can overdo the magnesium uh, and that will have negative effects uh, on intakes. Um, okay, I'll slip on. This here is, um, which leads on from that. If, if we want to control milk fever, we have to decrease the potassium, or uh, unless we're using a calcium binder. <coughs> but in most uh, cases, we're trying to decrease the potassium. If we decrease the potassium down, which we can do by taking the high potassium uh, forages out of the ration, there is a danger that you run into the issue of more and more and more straw, less and less and less of the things that perhaps are more palatable. If you can't process that straw really well, uh, you can have the problem of sorting. You can also have the problem that intakes are uh, quite reduced. So there is benefit in going down. That's where we need to be, around about 1.4. We can drop down the level of potassium by dropping out uh, the high potassium forages. But beyond a point, there's almost a diminishing return where you decrease the potassium down, you don't get much increased benefit in milk fever prevention, but you have a negative effect on dry matter intakes. So there is a balancing act, and that's where I think you've really got to look at things like um, you know, smashing the ration to pieces. I, I like to see straw absolutely smashed to pieces. Um, mixing in water, maybe using things like citrus, a bit of brewers, things like that that are going to uh, make it more palatable. Because I have had the situation where I've uh, prevented milk fever problems and I've caused DA problems in their place just by uh, <coughs> making the cows eat less. Uh, that's part of the trial work that we were looking at is that it's fairly easy. If you have problems, you can look in the urine and find what the potassium excretion is. Um, and that will tell you how much potassium they're eating. And if it's really high, you've got to take something out to get that potassium down. Same thing with magnesium. If there's not enough in there, uh, you need to add a bit more. It's relatively easy to monitor uh, to see whether they are getting the right stuff. So just to summarize, uh, the first thing I think, you need a strategy to control very high NIFA production, both from uh, the foot point of view, um, but also huge negative effects it's going to have on fertility, liver function, uh, and the follow-on on immunity further down the line. Body condition score control is definitely the thing that you go for first. You need to be able to get the condition score uh, correct. If that involves feeding uh, very, very low energy density, far off rations, that is absolutely fine. I had cows that I put on to low energy density rations for months prior to calving and you decrease their risk of metabolic disease by doing that. So dietary energy control, we can't overdo uh, the amount of energy that they have during the dry period. The far off ration um, cannot oversupply them with energy for long periods, or they will increase their chances of behaving like diabetics. Prevent sorting, so if you have to use a lot of straw because you've only got high decabs or high potassium forages, smash it to pieces, get it wet, make them eat it by whatever means you can. Uh, the feed aspects, space, palatability, that will all have an effect on increasing dry matter intake, which is what we must do. And prevent the preventable metabolic disease. And what I mean by that is prevent milk fever. Because milk fever, it's easy to prevent, really. 
And if we don't prevent it, we have quite strong negative effects on intakes, immunity, uh, etc. cetera. Um, thank you for your attention. Date for your diary. If anyone fancies a trip down to the south of France, we have a course running there June the 23rd to 26th. It will be very uh, welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs>